Education Placement Matter. Eight, we agree with the Attorney for the Board of Education status of litigation pertaining to alleged DASA violation and negligent supervision. Nine, we agree with the Attorney for the Board of Education legal issues pertaining to possible pilot agreement with Raymore Living. Ten, review with the Attorney for the Board of Education legal issues pertaining to possible pilot agreement with Rampo Pinnacle. Great, thank you. So moved. Second. Teresa? Yeah, I'm going to ask you first. Aye. 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 What? Do you need to announce or add to the tape that I've arrived? Amani's here. Okay. All right. Ola's Otherwise, I can't vote. Yep. So Amani's here. She made it before I finished or before I started the okay. aye motion. So <laughs> Ola's Bear is going to say aye. 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 Very good.
graduate through the child psychology program. Wednesday, June 7th is the senior sports banquet at Crown Plaza in Suffer from 6.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. Um, from June 7th to June 12th is finals week, and the regions are administered from June 13th to June 22nd. Thursday, June 8th is the third spring concert. There will be an ACT exam administered on Saturday, June 10th from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Suffer High School Senior Prom is on Friday, June 16th at the Pearl River Hilton from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Suffer High School Cap and Gown Assembly is on Tuesday, June 20th from 2.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Suffer High School Graduation Rehearsal will be on Thursday, June 22nd from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. at RCC Fieldhouse. And the actual graduation will be on that following evening from 7 to 9 p.m. Um, the Suffer High School crew team has won their seventh county championship in a row. And finally, I would like to congratulate Abby Bosco as Rockland Scholar Athlete. Thank you and have a good night. We have a great 
representation on our committee of uh, teachers, parents, and students. that we already have in the district that support this goal. Uh, we mentioned a lot of classes, instructional programs, various clubs and activities, and these are all K-12. The environment, uh, very supportive staff, uh, innovative and interested staff, the, re the partial restoration of field trips, providing those authentic learning experiences for students. And so then we had to look at, well, what will it look like if we succeed in these areas? Some of these are more conventional types of areas, like standards-based curriculum with appropriate rigor. We're used to measuring that. We're somewhat used to measuring technology. We have uh, our Clarity Survey, our Bright Bright Survey that we do every November. So we have a, a, a start there. What was really new for us was to look at how do we measure the engagement of learners with opportunities to pursue personal interests? How do we measure the opportunities to engage students in authentic learning experiences? So that's been around a lot of our conversation, has particularly been around those two aspects of our goal, about you know, thinking about how we measure that. And we're still talking about it. We, don't, we haven't answered that fully yet. And then uh, the overriding purpose of our committee is to work collaboratively to develop specific and measurable targets to help define successful progress toward the goal and objectives. At today's meeting, we did make some progress, uh, particularly in the area of standards-based curriculum in terms of win winnowing it down a little bit, um, also focusing a bit in the uh, technology survey, and we have some really great ideas about how to measure the opportunities to pursue personal interests and authentic uh, learning experiences, but I can't share them yet because they're not quite fleshed out. So that'll be an, uh, probably an update over the summer. And so our next steps of the committee are to prioritize and select metrics. So what are just, how are we gonna take that whole big goal and just using three to five measures, how are we going to measure that? And then where needed to create and implement new metrics, largely around the pursuing personal interests and authentic learning experiences. So that's the exciting work of our committee. And as I mentioned, we had a conversation about <coughs> what's already going on in our district. And so what we're gonna do for the next probably 30 minutes or so is really take you on a journey that gives glimpses of what's happening in our classrooms. And I have to say, as many participants as we have today, I wanna to thank all the teachers, the administrators, 
and the students who are going to be part of tonight's presentation, I have to tell you that this is just a slight. <coughs> this is happening in so many more places in our district, but you know, I did have some restriction of time and how big the room is. <laughs> and so we're going to take um, some time right now to highlight just a few of the places where some really exciting new things are happening. So I am first going to invite my friends from Montebello up. by researching all different types of robots, um, including those that were developed to complete tasks that are um, too dangerous for humans to go into. Um, they learned that in order to do so, that they have to follow a five-step process, which is the engineering design process. They have to ask what the problem, um, what is the robot designed um, to solve. They then had to explore and do research on other robots that have been, that were designed to solve some of these problems. <coughs> what types of skills or other knowledge would the designer need um, to develop or design a model. Then they had to create their own models. Um, they had to sketch them, they had to label them, they had to um, include any information about how the robot works, and that was when they were finally able to start building, which kind of was a hard thing when they were just ready, so excited to get into it. Um, they then had to evaluate how their robot was working, they could go back and tweak it, and then they um, had to explain if the robot solved what task they wanted it to solve, and if it didn't, what could be improved going, going further. So, um, we're going to start off with the VEX IQ um, robotics, which is our fifth grade curriculum. So the first thing that they had to do was build a test bed, which taught them about input and output. Um, they had to learn how motors worked and how sensors worked. Um, when they were done with the test bed, they got to build a toy. They got to build a model and for a prototype. It had to have, it had certain criteria and constraints that they had to follow. When they were done with that, they built a chassis, which is up here. Um, and they just had to learn how all the pieces kind of work together and how to use it, but that was with the remote control. Um, and now they are currently um, working on how to make that chassis autonomous. So I have Lily here. Does anyone want to join Lily? Yeah, Lily. <laughs> She's going to show you the test bed, which was the first start of it. So I guess you could just talk about how inputs, right? Inputs are like our senses. Go ahead, you go over Go to the other side. You can join us. Can we go over there and show how it works? Can we go over so, and who's working on the chest? Mr. McCarran's class. And Aaron and Maddie, come on up. We're going to show the first part. Ready? Okay. Robots are often used by humans to go in dangerous places and complete tasks that may not be, that humans may not 
So during our IE time, um, we've had students engaged in three different types of robots. Um, in programming and or building them. And um, their challenge is designed to meet their level of understanding of robotics. So the first one that we have is Dot and Dash, which program, it's programmed by Blockly, which is a block, um, a visual block program run on JavaScript. So the first thing that they can do just to try to understand um, coding, they can, um, there are 10 puzzles that they can unlock. Each puzzle builds on the knowledge from the, the previous puzzle. So. Puzzle, um, the, I think this is puzzle six, ladies? Or which one are we doing? <laughs> which puzzle okay. are we doing? Um, we're doing six. Okay. Okay. So who's going to do two? She can do two? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So. Jordan Brown, need to go? Six? Yeah. Go ahead. Put it on the floor. All right, so. Yeah, so tell me what puzzle six is. Makes dash dance, so they have to code it to make dash dance. Go ahead, let's see it. Yeah. 
their original one kind of um, had a had a problem. <laughs> had a challenge, it fell apart, and then they did this in two days. <laughs>
instead of a human going into a building to detect a bomb, there is a robot in place to help it. And so a robot has to detect its way around um, a building to try to find a bomb so people won't get hurt doing other things that robots can fill in for them. And I'll explain that to you. Of course, these are like little offices things, and this is the whole building. And the robot has to push this piece of paper, I don't know if you can see it, into this car. Go around, push that brick behind our bomb. And it has to push this here and push that so that the bomb isn't.
wonderful to see. And the best robots are a unit that all of our fifth grades are doing. Montebello has taken it a little bit further in some of the areas and uh, had some further explorations, as you can see. But um, very exciting work. Next, I would like to invite up um, a few friends from the next school. Direction. 
traditional locks, um, a lot of detail there. Um, so as far as skill building, this addresses the desire to have them read closely, read carefully. Um, and ultimately, the conversations they have are valuable because they notice that somebody can have a different interpretation from reading the exact same thing you just read. The teamwork is invaluable. Um, and I love the fact that our students did come out of this feeling like everybody's ideas matter, everybody's voice is valid, because you don't know where the next good idea will come from. And the critical thinking skills are phenomenal. Um, they really do learn to not cave into frustration when they're faced with a challenge, but to really embrace a growth mindset and persevere um, and ultimately solve whatever puzzles may pop up. Um, so we've built in them persistence and that ability to reflect and think about their own thinking. Um, there's not a lot of opportunities for metacognition built into our everyday lives, but it's one of the most important ways that we learn about ourselves as learners. And so as an end result, we have some proud students and some satisfied students, um, but they have that sense of accomplishment and, you know, we're just, we're just thrilled to be able to bring them these kind of opportunities. Um, at the end of the day, it really is never about who wins the prize. It's about the fact that we've all grown together. Thank you. Can you quit that? This is a video about the seventh grade science classroom. Science class is really like entertaining and fun because like you get like these like task lists and you have a certain date where things are due and then you have like checkpoint quizzes which are usually like five or ten questions and then it's really just like kind of like you work at your own pace so like if you finish your 15 pages that you have to do in like a week and you finish it in like two days then you can go around to the next part of the task list. Um, so like we get a notebook and a task list and we have to complete the notebook in a certain amount of time and we get like sections of the task list that we have to do. The task list is easy to read and it keeps me on track with my list. It keeps you very organized. I like how they set up I did because I know that when I did in the finishing class I want to do that. Um, so one of the science teachers makes videos and puts them on YouTube and so we watch them at home and um, my mom did like to learn a lot and if I don't understand it, she'll be able to understand it and explain it to me. So then like that helps me do a lot better too. The videos are easy to take notes on because you can pause it and look like that when you copy it. I like knowing that the information is coming straight from our school. And it's really good because like you can rewatch them to study. Science class, it's really kind of either you can work independent or you can also work as a group to get your work done. Um, and it's not like you sit down and then you just like let the teacher talk. It's kind of like you learn on your own and then you ask questions about it as you go. When we walk in, we start our gym We do our workbook, labs, Kahoot, test with a video, gizmo, and quiz. I like it because last year the teacher gave us assigned work and stuff. This year we get that, but we don't have to work kind of together. We're able to do our own stuff and not have to wait for the class to do what we need to do. We get to, if we go ahead, we get to go ahead and get the work done early and not the next question. Science classes help me uh, here by managing my time. What I like about science this year is the lab, because the labs are very creative and fun, and you actually, you get a look at your foot and you get to solve problems. We like science because you get to work in your own and you get to be more active in your learning, so you're not just sitting there and being lectured by a teacher. It really helps me with my time management because I knew that I had to do my work and I could be full of fun. And also help them with communication skills because we have to communicate to know what we what grades we got and what how to do. I like our science because it's fun, it's productive, we get to work with our friends, and it's really helpful. Well, it's giving us like more independence and like how to do things. Instead of like people listening to him teach us how to do it, we get to like do it ourselves. And if we have like a question, then we ask him to explain to us how to do it. It kept me like really organized and really tasked with everything. I like it because you can be very independent, but at the same time working with your friends. 
but still getting all the work done. So you really have to be smart about it because there's no one telling you that you have to do this like right now. You just have to learn that you have to be able to get stuff done without fooling around. My favorite part about science course is that we have the liberty to try do what we want in the order that we want. I think there's definitely is a good like learning experience because it made me more independent as a worker and it made me understand what I need to do, like how I need to study by myself. Like there's like new furniture so it's just like more comfortable. It makes you feel like you're like somewhere like like a science lab is like like it's not in like an elementary school where you're cramped in and the teachers teaching things like you go around and you work with other people and you take responsibility. It's not like an annoying teacher standing up there talking the whole time. You can actually talk you're free, you can talk to your friend, you can like you know, it's, it's just like a open like a fun learning part. <laughs> videos that the teachers have created, but we also utilize Rain Pop, Discovery Education, and Study Jam. There's the task list that lists all the work for a given unit. So that's the videos, the work with pages, the textbook readings, the hands-on labs and activities they need to complete. It also lists the due dates for everything. There's a checklist for the students to check off the work as they go to keep them organized. And it also lists the dates of the assessments, and the final component are the educational apps we use to reinforce learning, such as Quizlet, Test Wizard, and Google. What is a flipped classroom? Some of you may or may not have heard it. A flipped classroom is when students watch instructional videos at home and take notes on it, and then come to class the next day prepared to do work. So we've taken out that lecture piece in the classroom, and students now spend more time in the classroom actively engaged in their learning activities. It also allows students to work at their own pace. At home, they can pause the videos like the student said, take notes, go back and rewatch, and the teaching is repeatable. The students are able to go home at a later date or to study and rewatch that instructional piece. Here's an example of some of our supplies. There's lab books and workbooks that the teachers we've created. They can use any type of device. We're very fortunate thanks to Eric Rizzo that we have lots of technology in our classroom. The videos down here is a snapshot of our YouTube page and the videos that the students watch. And that's an example of what a task list looks like on the left hand side. The setup, we've been very fortunate that many of our classrooms got new furniture this year. And you can see there's soft seating areas, the chairs and the buoys, there's a lab area in the back, and then there's the regular desk for the students to sit at and work and this is a not elementary environment that student <laughs> was talking about. The skills, task list and flipped classroom really foster a culture of collaboration and communication within the classroom. The students have to work with one another to complete the labs. They may do some of it independently but some of it they have to do with a partner and they need to work together to complete the tasks and to solve the problems. They also need to communicate. They need to be able to share their ideas listen to others' ideas, and we say they need to be able to respectfully disagree with one another in order to move forward. It also fosters independence, responsibility, and time management. Since a teacher isn't saying, you need to be done with this page right now, the students really have to take control and decide how they're gonna organize their time. Some student groups even will assign themselves homework. They'll say, okay, tonight we're gonna watch these three videos, and then when we come to class, Tomorrow we're going to do this. So the students really outline what they're going to be doing in class. Okay, here you can see the students at the ends of the table. We have whiteboards and the students like to share their ideas, teach the other students in their group, and show their thinking. So it's a great tool that we have in our classroom as well. The environment, it is a fun environment. They said in the video, I have fun, the students have fun. It is flexible. The students can choose where they want to sit in the classroom, whichever is most comfortable for, comfortable for them. They also have choice in learning activities that they're going to be doing in class. Again, student in the lab area. The students, the lab materials are set up in the back of the classroom. The students can take the materials as needed and can set up the labs and again, go at their own pace. 
here's the students, they watch videos at home on balance and unbalanced forces, and when they came to class today, we did an activity on gravity and balance and unbalanced forces in class. It's student-centered. Again, the teacher's not standing up front of the class lecturing for <coughs> all the period, most of the period. So what that frees the teacher up to do is really to walk around the class and facilitate, check in with each group, and spend time with the students that have questions or need a little reinforcement. Also gives the students choice, ownership, and control. And you can see in this picture, some students are on the computer doing a test visitor, <coughs> there are students in the back doing the lab. So when they are given the choice to choose what they want to do, they really take ownership of their learning in the classroom. <coughs> Again, students, these three boys are all actually working on a different page in the workbook, but they're all sitting with each other, talking with each other, and having fun. Tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, but involve me and I learn. That's it. All right, thank you so much. Wonderful opportunities for our students at Sefford Middle School. And lastly, I would like to invite our friends from Sefford High School up. Hi, how are you? I'm Andrew Trust, the uh, principal of. Uh, assistant principal of the high school. Um, so at, at Suffern High School, we uh, embarked on an initiative this year called 20% uh, time. Essentially what 20% time is, it's, a, it's a, a program that's derived from Google that Google has used more in its early years rather than its present day, where employees of Google um, are encouraged to use 20% of their time to work on a project that they feel passionate about. Um, and through that 20% time at Google, they resulted in the creation of products like Gmail, Google Calendar, Google Apps for Education, um, our Google Slide that we're using right now is an app for education. The students and I worked on one collaboratively and we're never in the same room and we created a presentation that, we, that we're gonna show tonight. Um, and that movement has kind of worked its way into education. And in schools, the 20% time is basically, it's teachers letting go and allowing their students to use 20% of their time to work on a project that they see value in. Um, it could be 20% of the day, 20% of the quarter, 20% of the year, 20% of the semester. At Suffern High School, it's pretty much become the eight day project. Um, we have a five day rotation. The eight day has a little bit of a shorter period. So a lot of our teachers, the five that are doing it, kind of focused on the eight day. So every eight day, they use as their 20% day. For the most part, some, some uh, wavering there. Uh, at the school, at Suffern High School, we had five teachers in our initial cohort that were doing it. Uh, I had to write their names down because I knew I was going to forget. Uh, Ms. Minnick, Ms. Edelman, Ms. Luciano, Mr. Kaplan, and Ms. Burgess. And we tried to spread it out. We intentionally kept it small so it would be manageable so that if we came across any pitfalls or stuff like that, we, we would be able to um, correct them immediately and not have to work on a long, such a large scale. So how it works. So. <clears throat> The high school, uh, the theme you're going to see with us is the same theme that we've been hearing all night. It's about you know kids working collaboratively, kids working on things that is important to them, kids accessing their intrinsic motivation. Uh, but in the end, you, we're still working with kids, and we have to keep them motivated. We have to keep them focused. We have to keep them on track. Um, so what we did initially is we did goal setting lessons, and we. We met with the kids, made sure that they weren't uh, being too lofty in the projects that they wanted to, to do, uh, that they weren't um, trying to accomplish something that they just simply weren't gonna have enough time to do. Um, another thing that we did is something called elevator pitches. And basically what an elevator pitch is, is um, you, know, you have a great product you wanna sell and you can't find anybody to invest in your, in, your, in your company. And then all of a sudden one day you get in an elevator and there's a head of a Fortune 500 company in the elevator with you. And you got 30 seconds to sell it to him until he gets off on the top floor. And so we did elevator pitches and the kids filmed them and then they showed them to their class and their classmates then decide, all right, that's a good product, that's not a good product, or that's a great project, that's not a great project. And they kind of work it through that way. And then kind of keeping them modest, there's bi-weekly <coughs> meetings where the kids check in with the teachers, uh, weekly and monthly reflections so that they're, um, that, that, that they're talking about their journey and things that they learned and they haven't learned. And then there's monthly presentations to the class. 
It's a little different in every class. This is kind of just a general format of it, but as the subjects, and I'll talk about it in a second, as, as you get connected to subject matter, it, you kind of got to waver a little bit. So as far as assessment is concerned, we use rubrics um, so that the students are aware of what they're going to be graded on. Uh, the, the reflections are graded through a rubric, the monthly presentations are graded through a rubric, and then of course the final presentations are graded through a rubric. Uh, connecting to content, which is a difficult thing at the high school because so many of our classes are driven by Regents exams, um, and you can ask our teachers, you know, if, if we want to do something like this in a Regency class, the first answer we're going to get is, well, I got to prepare the kids for the Regents, I got to prepare the kids for the Regents. So we shied away from that this year. Um, but it is possible, and one of the reasons we shot away from it is because we wanted to see how it was going to work for us, and then our cohort went and visited another teacher in another school who does do it through a Regents class, and um, it is possible. And just as an example of what she does, that teacher who's in another district, she, she teaches a living environment class, and she had to connect 20% to living environment. And the students, one group of students in her class, they created a living environment curriculum for kindergarten classes. So they were, they were doing something that was preparing them for their regions, but also a 20% time and something they enjoyed because they got to go down to the kindergarten. <coughs> the, the most important thing is it's about the journey and it's not necessarily about the end product. And failure is an option. We have kids that are at the high school that they just simply didn't succeed in their project. They either bit off more than, more than they can chew or there was an unexpected um, you know, bump in the road and they just couldn't complete. So we've kind of thought about it because you know, working with high school kids, some of the kids, once they realize that, that you know, I'm not gonna get this done, they, they lack their motivation and, and they start to kind of you know, fall off a little bit. So we, I've talked with some of the teachers that maybe we put like a, some sort of a bonus at the end of the, end of the road. So if you follow it through, through fruition and you complete you know, 100%, you get this type of bonus, you complete 70%, you get this type of bonus, um, so we're talking about that for next year. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start with our first group. We're going to come up, Bryn, Megan, and Katie. Uh, they're going to tell you a little bit about their future Mounties program. They're probably the three most popular kids in the entire district because everybody loves it. Get up there, girls. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm Bryn Mydell. I'm a senior with the high school. Oh, I'm Megan McCarran, and um, I'm a senior at Southern High School, too. And um, we're both doing our future Matthews project in our Spanish class with Ms. Luciano on every <coughs> day, like um, Dr. Trust said. And um, initially, we had a little trouble figuring out what we wanted to do. We both have like interest in sports, and for me, I want to be a teacher, so um, we try to, tried to combine both of those, and we came up with um, future Mounties. So um, um, basically, what we decided to do was create an elementary school after school program to introduce varsity sports. That way, they, before they join the modified teams, they would actually know how to play them um, without like, learning as they try out, or it'd be better for them at tryouts by that time. Um, um, yeah. yeah. This is like, these are some pictures of what we did. So like each day we did a different sport. We had an outline of our schedule. Um, we split them into groups at times. We had winners and we had tournaments. And each time we invited a varsity athlete or two to come and help. And because like me and Meg don't know all the sports and how to play each sport, so they would come and help. And like the kids loved it because it was people that they looked up to. Yeah, like in the bottom picture, as you can see, those are two um, of the varsity hockey players at Southern High School. And like all the kids were so excited and like they were just kept asking for um, all of the varsity athletes to come and. Um, we really wanted to try and like, if we had more time, we would want it to um, go like district wide and have it at every elementary school. But we started at Wilkesburg because we thought it would be like small and like, but we thought we'd get like about like 20 to 25 kids like to sign up and we end up with like 40 kids in the gym. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot. It was, in the beginning it was a little <laughs> overwhelming, but like with the help of um, Dr. Lloyd at Wilkesburg and Mr. Rogers, it was a really good program. Yeah, it was really successful. And they're right, like, we've already been asked what's going to happen next year. Um, so now we're trying to figure out how do we keep this program alive for next year? How do we spread it to other elementary schools? And that's the great thing about 20% is as the years go on, teachers can hold on to the projects 
And then kids that can't figure out what they want to work on, they can go to the project bin and say, oh, this looks good, let me build off of this, and then they turn it into their own thing. So the, the girls did a great job, it was, it was amazing. Uh, now we have Emily coming up to talk a little bit about our art project. Dr. Trust said I was doing my project in art. Um, so I chose to base my project on astronomy and space because I just find it very fascinating. And for a while, I kind of just like took my time to research <coughs> like all different phenomena that happen in space and like celestial bodies and just all sorts of things. Um, after I did the research in um, class, I pretty much did rough drafts to figure out how I was going to uh, make my paintings. And overall, I made two paintings. Um, one was of a pulsar, which is like uh, a white dwarf that pretty much um, has a massive amount of energy coming from either sides and really just rotates at a fast pace, making it seem like it's pulsing or flickering. And then my second one was a gravitational lens, which is um, pretty much how you can tell there's a black hole, because it's black, you can't really see it. So um, what pretty much happens is, since the um, black hole has so much gravity, the star's light from behind it kind of morphs around it to create like a circular ring pretty much. Um, my project was going to be um, like multimedia, but in the end I just chose to stay with like acrylic because I was actually afraid to use it, so I figured just stick with one and just continue. Emily, I'm like, you have to focus on the fact that you learned so much about science because she learned all this stuff about science and then turned it into art and then used the paint that she's afraid to use. And, and, and so that's part of the journey because, you know, obviously they came out amazing, but if they didn't come out amazing, look how much she learned from her project, you know, and that's, and that's the important thing for us. Our next group is the texting while driving group. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alice Brown. I'm Megan Bonus, Alexa oh, Ferris. Um, and here's our 20% project on texting and driving. So, uh, why is it an issue? So, texting and driving is a major issue amongst our age group teenagers, and it's actually the number one killer of teenagers. And cell phone use while driving leads to approximately 1.6 million crashes each year. And so we really wanted to hone in on this because it's so um, relevant within our age group and amongst our peers that we wanted to hone in on this. So um, what are we doing? So in our Cambridge course, we, just, we were doing the 20% project and we chose texting while driving, obviously. And because Cambridge is a research-based class, our um, texting while driving solutions were also research-based. And so we began this in December and we decided to use a solution that was systematic and repetitive and because research shows that repetition is effective in persuasion. So like Megan said, it's a research-based course, so we had to research our topic, obviously what we wanted to do, and then we had to research the best way to implement it among the community. So we found that repetition was the best solution, but we also combined it with technology and um, so with the technology, we found some simulations that we wanted to bring into the school where you can actually sit in a car and be on your phone, not moving, of course, like a stationary car, thank you. And um, with the help of Dr. Trust, we actually got a response and we think that we're gonna have it um, in our school next year. So we had to do research for that and also for some speakers that we wanted to come and talk to the students. So our plan in total, like she said, it was a simulation as well as speakers and a club. So for the speakers, 
um, because Cambridge, like we said, is research-based. We evaluated a few different speakers and found that a woman named JC Good is the best fit for us. She's been to our school before, and she was unfortunately involved in a car accident in which her parents were killed by a driver who was distracted. Um, hopefully we will get her in next year to speak to um, student body because obviously that's a very memorable thing for everyone to hear. Um, also, we started the TAD Club, which is Teens Against Distracted Driving. Um, so we're trying to make events throughout the year to make it a repetitive approach. And we're thinking about fundraising through a car wash and a table for spring week, which is next week. Uh, we're going to try to reach out to the elementary school, middle school, and parents because we've actually connected with an organization in California called Impact Teen Drivers. And they're going to try to teach us and our club members the curriculum. And we're going to try to um, teach kids about this from a young age, as well as their parents, because this is an issue for people of all ages. So um, overall, we're really excited about the progress we've made, and we're excited to, con con to continue for the rest of this year and go into next year. So these girls pretty much struck lightning in a bottle because unbeknownst to them because they were in 10th grade this is something we focused on at the high school every two years on our 11th and 12th graders and then the, the 11th graders become uh, 12th graders and then then they graduate and then the new group of 11th and 12th graders we do a distracted driving um, uh, presentation so I went in and I was watching their presentation I'm like, this is a home run. It makes my job easier because they've done all the legwork already. Uh, the Arrival Live Tour is one thing that we are working on. It's, it's, it's not cheap, but it's amazing. Kids get, they bring the car to the school and the, the kids get in it. They have like the virtual reality goggles on. It's amazing. Um, we're going to work on getting that. The girls are going to work on it for, for early next year. The great thing about their group is they're 11th graders. So they get to do their 20%, and they're Cambridge students, so the Cambridge class is a 11th and 12th grade program. You go from 11th grade Cambridge to 12th grade Cambridge. So they're gonna ride this 20% right through 12th grade, um, because we have both Cambridge teachers working in the 20%. Uh, Victoria Voigt is gonna come up with talk about our ancestry project. Hello, I'm um, in English class. We decided to do a project that relates to us where we come from, who we are, and we started off with an elevator pitch, describing five things that we think describes us, like where we're from, what we like, sports, arts, music. And we started using websites like Ancestry.com, figuring out where we're from, looking back into the history. And I figured out that I, I'm Polish, and I visited my, where I'm from and the family, and I've learned a lot from my experiences. We did an in-family interview with a person that we care about. We told us about what, what they experienced as being young people. And I've learned a lot more, and I want to connect more with the family that I didn't know. And I visited the places I've been and where we're from, and just experiencing the culture and understanding where you are and who you are, where you are and where you come from, is kind of impressive. Like, I come from Poland. I came here and I'm growing up. I learned a lot from the past and I'm learning from the future. That, that shows like the intrinsic motivation side. It's something that's important to her and, and she accesses it. The book is here, Victoria. Where is it? So this, right, I, I made her do a picture because I didn't know how big crowded it was going to be here, but she created this book, um, uh, which is basically her whole project, um, and it's just amazing. Um, this was one of the classes where the teacher decided to go with a theme. Um, all the students in the class were working on an ancestry theme, um, and it's just the way the teacher decided to manage it as, as far as connecting it to content. So one more group, Operation Donation. Hi, I'm Skylar Smith. I'm Sarah Tavorda. I'm, I'm, Michelle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Michelle Sang. Um, and so we're Operation Donation. We are part of the Cambridge program as the other texting and driving group is. And for our Cambridge like project, we had to research a global issue, and our global issue was malnutrition and poverty. So 
we decided to take the research that we did for our projects and implement it into our 20% goal. Um, we decided to choose this topic because we never realized to what extent it affects our community suffering. 12.9% of our community is below the poverty line and to many of us it was a surprise because when we think of suffering we really don't think about people being under the poverty line. So part of our project is we wanted to make it easy for people to donate. We find that a lot of people want to donate but they don't really know where or what to donate. So we want to avoid that waste. So currently we're creating a website and an app and this will help filter down which donation centers that are available and what you can donate to. So it'll make it a quick, quick and easy way to access all these goods. So with the app, you don't need to print anything out and you can access it right on your phone. So that's what we're hoping to do, roll out by next year. Um, so one of our first projects in action were community outreach. You might actually find it at Acme right now. Um, we're planning on setting up boxes at local supermarkets, maybe ShopRite, even Costco. And we're putting up posters, as you can see, with our logo and a bunch of information. Um, and we're also setting up flyers. Um, they have the shopping list of the goods needed. Um, one of our main projects is called Backpack Snack Attack. And what it is, is we're collaborating with the Rotary Club and All Souls Community Church. And they create these backpacks for the kids below the poverty line. And it's filled with breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. So they have food over the weekend, so they don't have to go hungry. And so as of right now, they go out every other week. And our goal is to work with them and collect the right goods that is needed so that they can go out every week and no kid has to go hungry. So as of right now, we have a box set up in front of the main office, as you can see over there. And so we're also planning on spreading this project to um, the elementary schools. So far, I've touched base with Viola and Cherry Lane. Um, and so if you would like to help us, you can go follow our Instagram page, Twitter page, or Facebook page. You can turn on your phone right now and go follow us. <laughs> or if you have any questions, you can email us at operationdonationshs at gmail.com. So we found out that it was really important that the right things are being donated and that like every donation counts. So that's why we wanted to make it easy for people to know what to donate. We have to help lower that 12.9%. And ending with a Nelson Mandela quote, like slavery and apartheid, poverty is not natural. It's man-made. And overcoming poverty is not just a, a gesture of charity, it's an act of justice. An act of justice that we, the community, have to solve. So uh, that's our last presentation, but taking a global Taking a global issue and making it a local issue, which is so important to us, you know, here at Capital Central, because we want more local environment, involvement. We want all our kids to be, you know, part of our community now and you know forever. We want them to stay here. Um, so, thank you very much. Um, that's it. So um, earlier when I was putting the final touches on this presentation, I said, well, I can't let it just end with the students. I think I should. I have another slide prepared, but I, I think I should just leave it right there. Um, that was really powerful. Um, and thank you all so much for your participation. Um, I just wanted to say I hope you've enjoyed these examples. And a reminder that these are just that. They are examples. This is not a comprehensive as long as it was, it's not a comprehensive showing of all of the wonderful things that are going on in our district. The middle school is also doing 20% time and um, lots of other great things.
motion we okay uh, uh chair and a motion to recess for elections results Craig, Teresa, second. All the favor, see the caucus saying aye. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're smart. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>